Welcome everyone. Uh, so nice to have you all here. It was 20 years ago in 2001 when our dear friend, uh, co-founder of Mind and Life, Francisco Varela, uh, passed away. Uh, in June, we launched a new webinar series uh, within the overall program of paying tribute to the anniversary spanning throughout the rest of the year, titled uh, Francisco and Friends, an Embodiment of Relationship. In this series, uh, Francisco's friends, colleagues, and dialogue partners share their personal experiences and insights working with uh, Francisco and where their special relationship led them in their life and work. We started this series with uh, two special minds, great friends of Francisco, uh, the, Dalai, the Dalai Lama on June 9th and Evan Thompson on June 14th. And in the fall, we continue the series with another two friends of Francisco uh, and Mind and Life Europe, uh, John Kabat-Zinn and Roshi John Halifax. And uh, today, it's a real privilege to continue this series with two doctoral students of Francisco Varela at the time, uh, Antoine Lutz and uh, Jean-Philippe Lachaud. Uh, my name is Gabor Karsai. I'm the Managing Director of Mind and Life Europe. And the title of today's uh, webinar will be The Francisco Varela Experience. Are you experienced? We are going to talk a little bit about the title later. Uh, the event uh, will consist of a dialogue uh, with uh, Antoine and Jean-Philippe, and we will have a live uh, Q&A session after the dialogue altogether it will take about one and a half hour and uh, those who follow us on uh, the youtube channel can also ask questions and i will try to uh, manage uh, those questions as well later on before uh, inviting antoine and asking the first question from you antoine i would like to introduce you and jean philippe uh, dr antoine lutz is currently a research uh, a director of research at the French Medical Research Institute in the Lyon Neuroscience Research Center, where he co-leads the experiential neuroscience and mental training team called EDUEL. Uh, after a master's degree in engineering and a BA in philosophy at the Sorbonne uh, under the direction of Nathalie Deprat, he did his PhD in cognitive neurosciences in Paris, France with Francisco Varela, where he applied for the first time his neurophenomenology program to study the neural correlates of attention and perception. Since 1998, Antoine has studied meditation with various teachers, including Minjo Rinpoche, Tsokni Rinpoche, Matthew Ricard, and Joseph Goldstein. During his postdoctoral work with Richard Davidson at the University of Medicine, Wisconsin, he studied uh, he started using neuroimaging techniques uh, and studied meditation practices such as mindfulness or compassion meditations in expert meditators and in novices who learned to meditate using MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction program. His current research group in Lyon uh, focuses on the neurophenomenology of mindfulness and compassion meditations and on the impact of these practices on consciousness attention and emotional regulations and pain perception as measured by cognitive affective and social neuroimaging paradigms using EEG, MEG, etc. And this research is currently funded by a European ERC consolidator grant. Dr. Jean-Philippe Lachaud leads the EDUL team with uh, Antoine Lutz at the Neuroscience Research Center of Lyon. He obtained his PhD in 1997 under the supervision of Francisco Varela, showing that high frequency neural activity picked up by intracranial EEG reveals neural activation and deactivation with millimetric and millisecond precision in the human brain. I know it's really, really concrete. Since then, he has used that approach extensively to reveal the large scale dynamics of major cognitive functions including attention, language, and memory. He turned that technique into the first system to map and monitor human cognitive networks in real time and ecological conditions. This is the Brain TV program. And more recently, he has developed the first French program to teach attention in schools, 
code at all, with tens of thousands of children now learning nationwide. So really significant scientific research. Uh, really significant scientific research, both uh, from Antoine's and uh, Jean-Philippe's uh, uh, work over the last decades. So I would like to ask you, uh, Antoine, if uh, you could just simply address the first question that I have, and then of course we can move on and discuss it further. Uh, how did you decide to study with Francisco? And what, what was your experience when you first met him? Um, well, it was, it was an, one of these uh, uh, haha moment, I have to say, when you... Okay. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I think someone has his microphone on. Yes. Okay, uh, well, no, I, 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 it was an interesting experience for me because it, 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 it came with a very a sense of certainty that when I, I heard oh, it. She caught that one. She caught that. She caught that. She caught Oops. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I was, I was, um, I, the way I met Francisco was during his, uh, the master program of cognitive parents, cognitive science in Paris University. And uh, Francisco was um, uh, at, at a seminar on, on, um, on consciousness and the neuroscience of consciousness and, and um, debating different theory on consciousness. And so when I took the class and I, I, I heard how he, he managed to, to um, tackle the, the question around the, the heart problem of consciousness. Uh, and um, with, um, uh, I was totally like uh, impressed by the, the, the person because it was you know, very articulated, very bright and um, and I have a, a kind of intuitive um, feeling that he was it was really the right person to work with because he, he could um, not only discuss science from a, a, a neuroscientific standpoint, so articulating the you know the neurophysiology or, or uh, in some of the neurophysiological mechanism involved in consciousness, but he could also like keep a link to any something intuitive about the experience, the phenomenology of of. Yeah, um, <laughs> of sound perception and uh, no so so I was uh, that was how, how I, I was when, when I met him I was totally like uh, um, I realized I was I was really looking for this type of mentorship and I so I asked him to, to do a PhD and and um, um, I had first to do my military services so I went to to um, uh, UC Berkeley for a year and a half to do some research uh, as a public services and then I came back and we start to work together on a, on this program of uh, neurophenomenology. Thank you, Antoine. Um, maybe Jean Philippe, uh, you can also start uh, share your first uh, experience with Francisco when you met him. How was it for you, and uh, what led you to 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 work with him? Well, it's a good story because I was in uh, I was doing my engineering school school, and I I went to Boston at some point. I was trying to find out what to do with my life. I knew that I had some interest in the brain at that moment. So I went to Harvard Medical School to see if I could meet some people. I remember being in an elevator and with someone who told me that he was in neuroscience. I said, what's your name? He said, um, my name is Abel, David Abel. And I said, well, like the telescope, just like the telescope. And actually it turned out to be uh, the Nobel Prize. Uh, so in neuroscience, I, I, I had no idea what, what, who this guy was. Uh, and I, so I made a fool of myself, but just to give you an idea of how novice I was at that point. And then I was, I went to the, the Cambridge Zen Center. There is a very nice Zen Center over there. So to, to practice, to be some people to, to practice with. And the last day, the day before I, I took my plane back to France, I met, I met this guy, that guy and I said, he said, what do you want to do with your life? So I said, well, basically I'm very passionate about attention, passionate about attention. And I want to study it from the brain side and also from the from the, um, the experience side what, and through Zen, what it is like to practice attention. And he said, oh, there is maybe one book that you should read. 
Uh, it's called The Embodied Mind, and you should try to grab it. So I say, okay, well, let's see. So I, I go to those very nice bookstores in Cambridge and I find it easily. And then in the plane, in the, at the airport, I just read that book and I say, well, that's it. There's that sentence. When Buddhism and, and uh, cognitive science, those two planetary forces uh, will meet together, what might not happen? And they say, okay, that's it. That's what I want to do. And then I look at the author, I see Francisco Varela, who is this guy, and I see he's a teacher at Ecole Polytechnique. And that, that was my school. So I was going that. that, that's where I was going the day after. So I immediately went to see Francisco. So it's, it's a bit of a karmic story. Uh, it's, 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 I was bound to, to work with Francisco. And then I went to talk to him and I said, well, you see, I'd like to study attention with you and maybe more meditation. And he said, no way, that's a scientific suicide. So you're not going to study meditation. You're going to study attention. So that was the story. Uh, which year was that, Jean-Philippe? Uh, sorry, uh, that was in 98, in 92, sorry, 92. So it was a bit before the start of my PhD. He said, come back, come back in two years when you are ready to, to do your PhD. And mm -hmm. then we'll work together. So the Embodied Mind book has just uh, come out. Uh, exactly. Yes, yes. That, that was the, the, the spark. And Jean-Philippe, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, Francisco like gradually changes his um, his position about about doing uh, research on meditation. Really, at, absolutely. Really, at the end, because um, initially it was very. I think he had a couple of bad experiences trying to 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 um, to, to to share his vision of integrating meditation with science, and I think he was very cautious. And I, and from, from from what I remember, it was really around two thousand one. When he went to one of the minor knife meeting in Dharamsala, when he met His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Richard Davidson and Mathieu Ricard, that they kind of decided that it was it would be worth to try now to to do some pilot data and and um, and uh, and that's when he started to 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 propose to to do some piloting data with with uh, Mathieu Ricard in at uh, in his lab in Paris, and yeah. And if I remember well, there was, before Francisco, there was that researcher in our lab who was doing some so-so science about meditation. And he was known because he was the guy who would just um, have incense in the, in the bathroom to do some kind of meditation. So he was the weirdo. And that was the, how meditation was considered in, in our labs at that time. Yeah, that's why for, for in, my, in my case, he, 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 I think the closer I could go, go to meditation was through neurophenomenology, absolutely. Which was, a, which was a kind of a, yeah a coded uh, framework to to talk about experience without using the M word. The M word. Can you can you share a little bit uh, just to just to imagine uh, us uh, participants uh, who didn't know uh, and were not there in the lab with you and Francisco. How was it? How, 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 you, how was the lab atmosphere and how was working with him? Uh, what were you doing on a daily basis? Uh, um, how was he? Well, well, he was more or less always smiling. And I would say there was, we were at the, so the lab was uh, downstairs. So in that little place with almost no light, uh, he was coming from that other lab in Jussieu with a big window, he could see the Seine River and everything. And then he, he, had to, he joined the lab and, and really it was a bit creepy. And the first thing he did was to install a little garden uh, with plants uh, just to, to change the atmosphere. And already that was something. And so we were at the, really in the remote area of the lab with some daylight and the, the flowers from Francisco. And then his office was even more remote. Uh, so we, he had, we, people, visitors had to go through our space to, to go into uh, Francisco's office. And we would see those weird people coming all the time, sometimes a Zen monk, sometimes philosopher. And it was, then we could hear from the office, just slaughter, those people laughing. And it was a big mystery. And then we see that guy, Francisco, living for three months, going to some weird places again in the mountains of Tibet or to India. What was he doing there? And it, was, it, it looked like the magical guy. And for some people like me, it, it looks almost like he had some magical powers and that he had a, this he, the hidden personality, like hidden, uh, uh, it, it was incredible. And then it was very, when he was there, I don't know, for me, I don't know, Antoine, for you, but I felt so good because he, so it was so warm and so, 
welcoming. There was a sense of family and friendship among us. And we, when we meet each other, the, the former students of Francisco is still a family. So it's really great. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And so right now, where I am, where I'm, I'm, I'm standing right now, I'm spending a, a one week of um, uh, for a medical pro, uh, a program at the medical school in France. When we we develop a program based on um, to teach uh, meditation to medical doctors and caregiver, and um, and at the beginning of the week that they so this week is on, the theme is on loving kindness and compassion. And it was funny because I was I had this uh, this, convers- this this uh, meeting in mind, and I and so doing one one meditation session that they gave us this interesting exercise of visualization when you coming from Paul Gilbert, a psychiatrist in the UK who work on compassion, and so he, you had to visualize someone uh, um, just a person that could have embodied some quality of um, of uh, ideal quality of compassion. So they try not to use any any kind of religious imagery. So, so I was just look, I was playing around with different person and different images, and and because I was I was uh, about to get, to talk to get to get this uh, this conference, I I, I brought, bring to mind uh, Francisco, and it was very interesting to notice in my mind that there was uh, it was actually very easy to do. Like there, as you said, there is a lot of um, naturally you come uh, an image of warmth and. Um, or space and care, and uh, also a, a lot of discernment. It was someone who was very sharp. And, uh, oh. Aha, yes. Oh. <laughs> and when I say was, there was space, I didn't only mention his, the space. <laughs> so his personality was very, very like, uh, yeah, you feel very secure in a way because you, f- you can see that there was some inner, yeah, as you say, something magical in the sense of inner, inner strength. And um, and uh, confidence and um, and also a deep knowledge about not only science but also yeah you could you can sense something and at the time I was I, I was not that all familiar with meditation but retrospectively it, I have to say he, he embodied many qualities that that are cultivated in meditation in uh, advanced practitioners so it was a um, yeah it was really a, an, an, a privilege to be to be just in part of this family. And uh, if you look back, and uh, also if you uh, look at yourself in these very days after, let's say, 25, 30 years, uh, w- what is the long lasting effect uh, of your relationship with him? Uh, maybe on, your, on you personally and on your work as well. Uh, maybe emotions, maybe concepts, maybe... Uh, words or experiences or even even maybe longer phrases or questions that that you 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 can uh, uh, trace back to to his influence well i don't know for me the the most important one was the i mean from day one was that he was taking very seriously the idea of confronting first person data the experience and third person data so the, the neuroimaging. And I must say that it clicked right away because I, when, even, even before meeting him, but especially when I met him, I realized that doing cognitive neuroscience is not like doing theoretical physics. It's a, it's a different kind of science because we all have a brain. And so we know what it is like to have a brain and to experience what the brain can produce. Oh, I mean, some of the things, there is, there is some aspects that you can study on, on how the brain works in relation to the body and the environment that you can study through, through introspection in a way, to discipline introspection and discipline with some mastery of attention that maybe you gain f- through meditation. And this idea that you develop very strongly that you could work on your attention, stabilize it and make it a tool to study the brain and the mind from the inside Bring, of course, that was from meditation, from his whole experience with meditation, and that this should be an integral, an integral part of neuroscience, of cognitive neuroscience. For me, was crucial. And the, the team that we are, that we are leading with Antoine has the, the term experience is really part of it, and that's the title of the of, of the of this talk. The fact that we experience what it is like to 
to have a brain in a body and so uh, it's very crucial. And that's not something that you can do in other kind of science. Uh, this is specific to, uh, to, to cognitive neuroscience. So something I try to bring along um, with me and in the different projects that I have, uh, it's completely there. And also just to extend on that question. Uh, so that was for the vision and the general philosophy and framework. And then very practically, uh, what it is was to initiate collaboration with, um, with clinicians working with epileptic patients and intracranial EEG. So intracranial EEG is that weird practice where you put electrodes inside the brain of people. Uh, so people, this is to cure them, in this case, epileptic patients. And, but you have to know that those are the most precise recordings that you can have of a brain, uh, of a living brain, living human brain, working human brain. It's millisecond and millimetric resolution. So it's, it's incredible. And he, just when I came back from the US, he, and that was in December 2000, 2000 I think. So it's he very quickly, uh, very shortly before the end. He told me, there is someone you have to meet. And he introduced me to Philippe Kahn in Grenoble, who is a clinician over there working with Epileptic. And that collaboration with Philippe was the launch of my entire career. From all the work I did with intracranial EEG. So that was Francis one of the many gifts from Francisco. Really. Antoine? Yeah, I, see, I think it was um, Jean Philippe and I um, um, just, just got um, managed to create the, our, our team. Uh, last January, and 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 it was uh, as you said, Philippe. It was really almost um, a private jokes, like a little little um, uh, a daring attempt to 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 make a statement to the field to call our team uh, experiential neuroscience and mental training. And uh, we say, well, let's try. And and no, I oh, am. Yeah, and so far, so good. No one, no one complained. And um, so it's um, it. I think it's one testimony about. Uh, about how, how we try to, um, as Jean-Philippe said, to carry one of the strongest um, idea of Francisco, which is to, to ne never departure from a, this very, I mean, fundamental question, which is uh, the nature of the relationship between uh, subjectivity as it's in its first person givenness and, and, um, and what we know about biology and the, um, the bio, biophysics of, of living organism. So really it's a very fundamental question about what, what is a, the, the basic relationship between these two types of, of phenomena. And um, so there, there are many, multiple ways to, at least in my, in my, in my uh, the work I have carried, uh, I think it's, it is central, this question. Um, I think, in terms of the science, uh, what the, the, the gift of Francisco was to, to orient me at the end of, um, uh, I, I mean, uh, I, I, at the end, the end, he put me in touch with Richard Davidson um, and, and he somehow uh, allowed me to, to go there for my postdoc and I stayed there for like a decade uh, and starting with uh, doing some uh, work on brain imaging with expert practitioners. And then uh, some clinical work on, on mindfulness-based stress intervention, and and um, and since then I have really focused my, all my research on um, on uh, understanding the neurophysiology of, of meditation. And for me, it was a, it was one one easy way to um, pursue the more theoretical way work of Francisco, which was to to understand uh, uh, what what he called neurophenomenology, which is the, the Try to link the in a, in a very rigorous way the the first person um, experience with with um, n n various neural correlates uh, and and the one, one, so I could elaborate on that point a little bit later if you want but one point I want to say that it's it's what is quite fascinating with the framework that Francisco tried to to put in place it was that it was not only something motivated by uh, a neuroscientific quest, but it's somehow um, a vision about also uh, that scary, very practical, uh, with a spiritual or at least a clinical or um, therapeutic dimension in it, which is um, 
that that's that uh, that has actually a, a lot of implication. And, and one way to describe that is, for instance, the program that we we're doing now in Lyon. That's a, and I could just maybe try to to describe how I see it as a an expression or of some of Francisco's vision. So often, uh, you know, if you you, you if Francisco, uh, uh, you know, Philippe could uh, also describe that. Um, Francisco had in mind that he, the, the ideally idea was to, to cultivate a, a generation of scientists who could be trained both in science and also in um, first-person methods like meditation. And, and that's some, some, something we try to do here in, the, in this program. So for we, we have um, two weeks uh, in residence and, uh, for, and caregiver are coming, medical doctor, nurses or researcher. And the first two days, they just immerse into practice. Practice on mindfulness, meditation, loving kindness, compassion. And then we, we provide um, any kind of uh, uh, academic knowledge on, on this practice from philosophy, humanities, neuroscience, clinical research, and so on. And what is fascinating to me is to see that, that somehow, the MD start to, to really experience the, the embodiment of knowledge in the sense that, for instance, when they, you talk about pain, uh, you could describe pain in, a, uh, in terms of its neurophysiology or in terms of its clinical implication in chronic pain, in a depression, fibromyalgia, and so on. So in a very objective way, or you could talk first person and, and um, and I think what, one, one take home message is that, I, that I can see in this, this uh, program is that you, it, has, it could have the potential to really change the way, uh, for instance, medical doctors are related to the, their patient in the sense that through this type of immersion to experience, they, they, I could see a shift in the way that somehow they, they are much more open now to um, pay more attention to the, the, the kind of the nature of the therapeutic relationship with the patient. And there, there's a sense also that, that they, I mean, they start to better understand the, how uh, it could impact also the medical practice in the sense that they now, now they, they have almost two ways to, to interact with the patient through uh, a standard medical practice, you know, through um, um, drugs or um, any kind of intervention or through um, a first person approach like the mindfulness meditation for instance and 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 so you can see uh, also that this type of integration of first person and third person knowledge can translate then into um, a change maybe in the way we um, we and we can see uh, medical practices in in our society so I, I think that's really fascinating to me and I I could see that as a, as a outcome of some of uh, Francisco's vision um, in his work. Thank you, Antoine. Uh, Jean-Philippe, uh, would you like to add something to that? Because Antoine referred to uh, you maybe adding uh, your experience with this program. Yes, I can talk uh, for, for instance, the Brain TV program, which is really um, an extension of what I think Francisco was trying to do. Um, and the idea is that you some so those epileptic patients I was talking about the with the electrodes inside their brain uh, we developed a system where they can they can see the activity the activity of specific brain regions online uh, real, real in real time and for me it's really important because it's the way at some point someone must have in what well, you need to put in one place the first person data and the third person data if you want. And the best place to put it is in the mind of the, of the participant. So if you're the participant, you have these electrodes inside your brain, you have a direct access to your conscious experience. So the first person view. And then if you have a screen with also your, your brain data, then you have a, you're in a unique posi position to establish correlation and to make sense of what you see in terms of brain data from your, from your own perspective as a subject. So that's something we've been developing. I think it really goes into the, the way of, of neurophenomenology. And for instance, there is this, um, there is this intriguing region, which is called the insula, and maybe Antoine can talk about it. I mean, we are fascinated by this region. It's like a, it's like a, 
uh, shell or whatever that you have is something like that, that it, that's right there you have one and, and two in your brains on each side and it's close to the ears and it seems well it participates to the to the fit to the feeling of being alive and, and having a body but also to more cognitive aspects and there is this very um, mysterious area which is at the top and the front of, of the insula and seems to be involved in a in cognition and so one thing that we do is that we ask the patient where's what it is like to, to, to have an activation of that area. And then they come out with, with explanations and say, oh, each, each time I really focus, uh, because that's our main hypothesis right now. It's really related to the fact that we intellectual work, intensely intellectual work. And one thing that was that struck me is that the last patient we have told us that there is it, 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 there was this activation at each time, this feeling of having the energy going up the body inside the head, inside her head. I said, that's what I feel when I get intensely immersed into some intellectual activity. And I feel I lose, I lose contact with my body and it seems to be just my head there. And that, that's what I experience when, when I see this activity rising up. And then suddenly I thought, well, maybe we might have something there because it's this when you get engage into really intellectual activity sometimes you get this feeling of energy moving so it's it opened up this 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 field of investigation of relating the activity of the insula with the feeling of energy moving through your body the the the, the idea of key of chi or just actually circulating so and that i mean that comes from this from this remark of that patient just matching her own experience with what she sees on the screen. So I find it interesting. It would be very difficult to get access to this kind of observation otherwise. Um, Gabor, uh, I saw some, some questions on the chat and I, it's a good time to maybe start to address some of them. Uh, I saw Marike, for instance, ask whether there were particular lessons from Francisco that we remember. And Maybe we can invite to... Marika to, to share your question. <clears throat> yeah, so, so, so Marika asked whether we have any kind of uh, lesson from Francisco that we try to, to bring forward to our own students. So maybe I think it's a great question. And I, if I may say, from what I remember, one particular quality that I, I found really interesting that, that, that I sense from him is, is a, um, a sense of trust. So, so it, almost that you, he can he can trust that you can do that that in your capacity to do something, and which is really comforting when you, you know, you are a young scientist and you don't you don't know much a lot of things, and that he can see the potential in you, and, and like this kind of, yeah, uh, that was one quality. Another one is that his, op his office was always open, and um, and there is a sense of open uh, like. Um, accessibility that he was really like uh, really uh, ready to engage to any question that we had and um, and as I, as I said before I mean my, my what was really pr precious and it was it was my first experience in, in really in academia I mean my second one but I realized that is it, sometimes he, he was a little bit above the game if you want uh, the academic uh, academic games in the sense that you could see that he was he, he had a vision that was much deeper than just um, pure academic activity. It, so there is a sense of security to be with him. And I, I think uh, that he was uh, on board with you and he was fundamentally helping you. I, think, I mean, one time I remember crossing, uh, meeting him in this, uh, you know, this dark corridor that, that uh, uh, Jean-Philippe described before. And he was just coming from his operation. So he's very tired, low energy. And I would start to chat in the corridor and say, yeah. So I was wondering what he was, why he was back so soon. And, and uh, one of his answer was to say that he was, he was here just to, to help us. And uh, at the time I was kind of, ah, oh, is it really that? And so I was, I was, but retrospectively, I think he was very genuinely motivated to, to help. So, yeah, I think, I think it's, so uh, I don't know if I managed to, to bring all this quality in the lab, but, but I think, Having witnessed some of them, it's it's at least inspiring. Yeah, John Philippe, you want to add something? No, I'd say that um, well, it's hard to go beyond you know the basic thing. Yeah, he was warm. He was he was very sharp, a very sharp mind. But it's uh, it's something else. So it's I didn't grab something that I 
I do with my students because it's very hard to reproduce. How would do you would you reproduce the the sort of glow that he had and the fact that you felt really warm when you were uh, meeting him? It's it's more like it's it's not it's not something that you can decide to do. It's something something that he was just emanating uh, from him, and that's very hard to reproduce. Also, this sense of magic was super hard to reproduce. I give you an anecdote. Once I had, uh, maybe I was doing too much Zen, <laughs> Zen sitting at the time, but I was had that weird dream. You know, the, those very vivid dreams that you might have sometimes. And then that in my dream comes the Dalai Lama. Well, and he says, you should hurry. And whoa, I said, I, will, I knew that Francisco was ill. And so maybe I, I probably uh, that had come into my mind at some point and then came back in that dream. But it, it, he was really addressing me and saying, you should hurry, like you don't have much time left. And so I said that to that other PhD student, uh, Eugenio, and then that Eugenio, he told Francisco. And then instead, of, Francisco came back, came to me later that day. And he says, so you have, you have visit, some visitors? You got some visit during the night? And instead of just thinking it was rubbish, I, I could feel that he told me, yeah, once he had a very a strong dream and that someone was telling him to give a message to someone, to someone else. And he did, and he changed the life of that person. So he was really believing in that. So behind Francisco was that kind of, there was a curtain with a lot of magic behind it. It's weird stuff, super, super exciting that you wanted to get some access to. But that, so that was Francisco also. And how would you recreate that with your students? And you cannot, that was just Francisco. Uh, how many of you were there in the lab? Uh, because we are here with you, Antoine and Jean-Philippe, but there were others around. Yes, so one very, one very important person was Jacques, Jacques Martinry. Mm -hmm. He was the, the other senior guy and very, with Francisco, they were matching very well. So it was great. They were the two seniors. He was the engineer. And then the, there were the students. Uh, he, he, some people came, some people left. So there was um, Michel, Michel Le uh, who was writing books, doing great research now. Eugenio Rodriguez was there, of course. Then at your time, Antoine, there was Diego, Diego and, Spelling, and, and, David right. Rudroff, of course. Right. Uh, Claire Petit-Mangin was coming. Um, she was doing something slightly different, not neuroscience, so she wouldn't be there all the time. Uh, Antoine, who am I forgetting someone? Is Actually, this... Claire. Oh, oui, bien sûr, bien sûr. Tu, tu... Sorry, you're missing uh, Alexandre. Yeah, Alexandre was there, of course. Yeah. Actually, Claire is here with us today. Oh. Hi, Claire. Yes. Claire. Um, uh, Mareike, Mareike Smoka uh, has a question. Uh, Mareike, are you here? Can you, can you raise your question yourself? Yes, sure. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing all this insight information. Very interesting to listen to you. Um, this is really just a small, um, yeah, small follow-up on what you elaborated already um, with regards to the day-to-day -day life in Varela's lab. So to what extent uh, were you practicing together meditation? Was there a specific space? Um, yeah, how was that set up? Um, yeah, it would be nice to hear more about that. Thanks. Yeah, uh, maybe, and then not quite, you can come on, but meditation was something let's say private, we knew it was a big thing in the team, but uh, with Francisco, some of us were heavily involved in meditation, like uh, myself, Antoine also, uh, some others not at all. Uh, Michel Levanquien was always teasing us, he said, well, my meditation is just to take a nap. Uh, and then later I wrote a book <laughs> about meditation, so that's, uh, that's the irony, I think. Uh, David Rudroff also was not at all in it. So, so it was very, um, yeah, everybody has his own position regarding and interest regarding meditation, positive or negative. But uh, Antoine, you want to comment? Yeah, yeah, and, and and again, I think he was he was quite private about about it. Um, I, I suspect that he the way he was uh, he was trying to to introduce some core. Of, uh, Practice of meditation, core question around the practice of, of meditation and how it can and can uh, um, get uh, cultivate certain insight about consciousness. I think it was through the work um, on phenomenology and and there was a, a very close partnership with Nathalie Debra, who is here tonight. Uh, which when I think Nathalie helped him and also me for doing my my bachelor to to 
to translate some of, of um, Francisco's insight that he gained from experience from meditation into a language that would be more politically correct at the time. Um, because I think b- back then, the Francisco was really interesting by very, very, very uh, profound question about the nature of consciousness and, and nature of the self. And, 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 that, and, and through, through that, and he used phenomenology to, to articulate this, this question, in particular in his article on the, the phenomenology of time consciousness. Uh, so he was in general quite private, but for me, but when you ask him question, he was he was um, he, he, he was very generous just to um, give up, yeah to be very direct uh, advice. Uh, so for me, he, he advised to he advised me to 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 um, to join certain meditation groups and to do certain type of retreat, and 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 um, and also he put me in touch with um. Uh, um the son of his main teacher, Lamingo Impeche, that that become a, 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 a important teacher for me, and also a participant in our teacher in, a, in our study. So somehow he was, uh, yeah. He, he, I think he creates some boundary, but at the end of his life, I think <clears throat> the boundaries start to to blur a lot. And we also the boundary between work and family and per- personal space start to blur. You know, we start to be invited at this place to to. So it was it was uh, I think. Things become a little bit more intimate at the end because I think it was uh, a the, the, the constraint of life was, was like that. But, and so for us, it was very fortunate because we saw a side of Francisco that was that he kept uh, more, more private for a long time. Right, but I'd say that uh, a bit before he was really he would separate really his meditation and his scientific work in terms of students. So he had his scientific students, students, and his meditation uh-huh. students. So for instance, I, I remember going to. Um, to give a talk, and another another speaker was Fabrice Midan, uh, who wrote many books about meditation. Now he seems to have his own lineage and so, uh, in his own way. Uh, and Fabrice told me, "Oh, Francisco is my meditation teacher." So I didn't even know that that there were some that he had some meditation students. So it was completely separate. Uh, Marika uh, Marika Van Vogt, uh, you had a question that was uh, addressed by Antoine uh, in the discussion. I was wondering whether uh, it was answered the way you imagined or you would like to add more to it. No, I think uh, that was a, a very interesting answer and also gives, a, gives a lot of, uh, hello, <laughs> nice to see you. Yes, and it, I think it also gives some really inspiring examples for those of us who are leading labs and supervising students. So thanks so much for sharing that wisdom. Um, Natalie, I, I turn to you because you also asked the question that was partly answered in the chat, but it would be good to address it uh, more openly and uh, discuss it a oh. little bit. Yes, actually, it was a question. Uh, no, <laughs> it was a bit of a joke about... Uh, the, the students you have in your own program, Antoine and, and Jean-Philippe. And I was wondering if you also had uh, students in philosophy uh, because they would, um, well, I was a bit joking, but uh, you were, they would, uh, I, I think, quite need also to embody uh, a bit more what they're thinking. So, um, and I was quite un, uh, um, quite interested by uh, Jean-Philippe's uh, um, testimony about the, uh, the way um, when you are in a very mu- much intellectual, uh, in a very much intellectual state, um, as this kind of uh, warmth coming from the body to the to the head. So, well, I'm just adding that to my question because, uh, well, it well it echoed a lot uh, to many things I had in mind as well. So, but I was wondering. Mm. Uh, Antoine, you want to comment on the because in terms of uh, yeah students in um, there's f- student um, just in philosophy maybe that would be you because I, I couldn't give them good guidance that's for sure. I mean yeah in a way me, me neither but it's but it's um, but I, I mean it's a good interesting question um, I don't know if it's a sign of the universe but you so <laughs> students contacted me from PhD two days ago with a trying to discuss about you know. Uh, Radical embodiment and so on, and uh, yeah, I uh, yeah, and, and right right now there's very there's not enough space in um in my uh, 
in my mind to 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 take the to 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 take that on board, but but it's it, it might be yeah. I, I need to reflect. I never think about that to be honest. But it's an interesting opportunity uh, question. So maybe a co-supervision with you, Natalie, maybe one day to discuss. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <What>? Well, <laughs> I mean, because phenomenology it. is actually uh, not. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's a. Uh, I've been just to um, uh, to contextualize my my question. I was actually in a in a conference in phenomenology in Nice, in the mm -hmm. south of France, last year, last week, and it was very much. I mean, very much uh, speculative. Mm. and very much uh, intellectual as a kind of conference, uh, to, far too much for me. And I felt a bit isolated, actually. And uh, as you know, phenomenology is actually a philosophy that uh, needs to be embodied. So, well, I, I was just wondering uh, how it could be interesting for philosophers to belong to your, to take part in your program, maybe to embody more uh, what they are thinking about. So that that was the the, the no, question. It, it, yeah, um, you know, it's it's um, again I, again I see I see I see really the virtue of of uh, uh, the tr translation cr cr cross disciplinary translation uh, as Francisco did, and I think it was very very fruitful. Um, I'm thinking about the work he, he's done with you and all the work on on. Um, on time consciousness in particular, for, for me, was incredibly inspiring. And um, yeah, so I could see the, the, um, the virtue of that. It, it's just right now an issue of, um, of priority. It, like, I'm, I'm, if you want, if you look at the, uh, if I can talk about myself, I, I, um, I'm trying to push forward for, for the neurophenomenological agenda. And, and this, the next couple of years, I, I, the way I want to try to make progress in that direction is to Developing, uh, helping to develop the the formalism to de describe phenomenology. So I, I would I would I would put my effort more into try to to get more familiar with some some of the recent uh, neural computational approach and as a as a way to 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 create this bridge between phenomenology and and um, and neuroscience. And that's kind of for me the the hard part. And so so that's why I I, I will have limited time the next couple of years to just to. To, to 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 go into philosophy, but but that, but why not in the context of uh, of um, collaboration? If if I can add something there, it's, it's one of those many things that we miss uh, after Francisco's death is that there was in this one mind uh, so many expertise in relation to each other: philosophy, in Buddhism, in cognitive neuroscience, math, and so. And so we are left with just distributed expertise. So. I would have some, Antoine has some, Natalia has some, Claire has some, and so, and it's, we cannot recreate uh, unless collectively, but this ability to go smoothly from one field to the other one to build those links. And so you can see it, so that the, the fact that, for instance, I would not be, I would not have a philosopher as a PhD student because I, I cannot provide guidance or that's, that's this uh, evidence that we, we lack this ability that he had to, to be at ease with so many fields. I mean, that was the beauty of Francisco's mind. Mm -hmm. and, and, so, yeah, and sometimes I think, I think it was uh, also the, another expertise is a first person expertise as a practitioner. I think, I think he, he was the, one of his core insight, I think, is to, to be able to, to translate, uh, translate uh, into different languages uh, his first person experiences. So, he used a lot the framework of um, uh, so phenomenology, but also dynamical system theory, neuroscience, um, cybernetic. Sometimes he tried also immunology, but but there was always something. Very, very, so the insight was always very clear, and it's just a way to to translate again that from one domain to the next. But the the, the phenomenology was quite clear, and, and um, right now there there is a uh, I'm. I'm co-author of, of a manuscript that is, uh, I guess, should be accepted soon on, when they try to push this agenda and they call it um, um, uh, it's, an, it's an approach to, 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 of, to, to, to model phenomenology and as a, as a way to, 
to provide this kind of translation of of of, um, of experience into into certain certain uh, another language that is that is uh, derived from a um, um, contemporary com 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 contemporary modeling theories. So so that would be maybe one avenue to 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 continue some of his work. Uh, thank you um, for the question and for the answers as well. Uh, Father Francis posted a great question in the chat too, so I will invite uh, Father Francis to, to 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 share your question publicly. Yeah, it's so uh, interesting to listen to this conversation. Hi, uh, it's good to see you. Uh, actually, practically from the start of the conversation, I've been saying, uh, wouldn't it be great? To spend six months in uh, uh, Antoine's laboratory, you know, and, and just take notes, you know, and learn. Uh, but really, that's in a way what my question is saying. Uh, basically, what are the promising avenues uh, to studying all of the um, very important interfaces that we're talking about here? The interface between the body and the mind, for one thing, but also the way of using um, a, a now more subtle use of the EEG. I was fascinated to hear Philippe mention the uh, use of inserting the electrodes in the brain to get an even more refined EEG. So these areas, but which one of the things that I found fascinating and I reported on this a couple of years ago was the uh, procedure of using uh, flashes of different colored light on the entire body and trying to study, first of all, the first person uh, reports on that experience, and then to try to do, uh, you know, put electrodes across the body in order to study uh, the, the the presence of consciousness outside the brain itself, this kind of thing. But surely by now, we must have methods for doing that. I know Richard Davidson was trying this also with the Tukdam experiments, trying to figure out how to monitor uh, physiometrically the process of dying. Uh, but also, of course, the process of transformation in meditation would be something that could be studied with these methods. But I was wondering, you know, from your present laboratory experience, where are the areas that look promising, not just cutting edge, but promising and are producing uh, very good scientific uh, results? Um, I, I, think, I think there are different... different um, Domain that really different field. One 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 domain is if you look at the simply the brain. I, I think the, there's a lot of efforts these days to to try to uh, better describe the the for instance with the connectome project as an example the the different uh, the type of relationships that the the, the different brain region are are, um, are creating moment after moment. Uh, and and there is there is um, it's not a random process. It is follows certain hierarchy, a certain uh, configuration, certain pattern. And I, and I think this level of of um, large scale neural behavior um, it is is a, a very promising avenue to to map some feature of experience. Um, in particular, they, they've been recently with the Connectome project so, so, some new techniques to to look at the in a very synthetic fashion, the way the, the um, different brain networks uh, are organized in terms of cortical hierarchy. And so we have one project in the lab and we try to look at the, how meditation could to, to modulate, the state could modulate the, the hierarchy of, of a certain region. So how, for instance, one region become more, um, uh, which was very specialized, become uh, suddenly more integrated and high, go higher in the hierarchy or, uh, or one region become more transmodal, so integrating more brain. So, so we, we have now tools to, to describe that type of, uh, of behavior. And I, I, I suspect that will be a, a good place to, to look at interesting neural correlates. And next, uh, as you mentioned, the, the, the body, I think, I think that's something that's also very promising that there are new techniques that are uh, I think there is so low hanging fruits that, that that still need to be done in terms of uh, the impact of meditation on, on bodily states. So so Tanya, Tanya Singer had some interesting um, 
observation in a resource project when they, I think, she tried to look at color, for instance, into or, or space in the body um, according to different style of meditation. So you, you see that there is some invariant in the body, and in terms of color or in terms of position of attention and so on. And there are some techniques now when you can map and visualize something we tried to do in the Tukdam project initially was to 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 come you know in your thermal camera and try to see uh, to see how to to see to see different maybe energetic energetic features in the body it was by the way a very interesting uh, interesting moment to try to bring uh, a military equipment in india a couple of years ago so <laughs> but, but anyway so i think there is interesting question and and if you if i could be just an anecdotal it's funny yesterday the the, the teachers we have a, a psychiatrist who, who also trained in the Tibetan Buddhism and also a therapist. His name is Pascal de la Mier. He's a very brilliant guy. And so they did two intense days of of, um, of meditation and compassion. And at the end, the people were really exhausted. And he, so he said, "Well, they were we were able to do like tongue practice." And he said, "No, that too, too tired. Like do something like more." You know, like fun and playful. So, they, so they did this this practice, and it was when you you know they, it was just they found online this uh, this hum, you know hum practice when you, so this chant very repetitive of this hum when you breathe in or breathe out you have this hum, and and it was very interesting just to, to witness collectively what what are the energetic quality to be like just vibrating together and so all of these things would be very interesting fascinating to explore. But uh, yeah, they, I think they are all low hanging fruits. That need to be done, and but everything takes time, and you need to find the right measure. But I think it's very promising. Yeah, and I'd say maybe, uh, of course, we're all limited by the time of kind of techniques that we use and the, the amount of time that we have. But uh, I think that spending some time with the insula is really, uh, it's really worth it, because you have to, you have to see it. Of course, there is the body, there is the brain, but it's all it's so deeply connected. Of course. And the insula is really, there is a direct connection with the arm. That's all the parts of your body that you have, uh, just visceral mm -hmm. and so on. So it's really there. So there is this money, constant monitoring of the, of the body as it is now and as it could be, uh, depending on what you do. Uh, so when you start digging there, you, you start to find questions that, uh, that have been there for millennium, uh, this issue of energy, of how what is that feeling of energy that you have in your body and that moves with emotion and how comes that some part of the body seems to be more related to specific emotions uh, this idea of tension the 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 what is fatigue what is mental fatigue that that question why do you get what is ego depletion also this idea of not even being able to want something at the end of the day uh, it's probably some some elements of answers are there. The whole issue of um, our relationship with technology also. Uh, the fact that that's this entire generation that we have right now just constantly locked on our phones on our, on our screen. Uh, this this reduction of the field of, of the attentional field, the disappearance of the body when we're manipulating those technology. Also, I mean, the questions that are raised by that those new practices. In the insula also, you can find some elements of answers of maybe what we should do or, or what's happening there. So it's constantly, constantly fascinating. And also the, the insula, some part of the insula heavily involved in connecting brain regions between each other to, to create active networks. And that's something that we, that Francisco initiated with his, uh, his brain web paper in 2001, uh, that it's, we should look at connectivity uh, just uh, real-time connectivity, dynamic connectivity in the brain to really understand uh, how it works. Uh, you, you work, you are too modest. It was your work. You co-signed the papers. We, yes, we, we wrote it side by side uh, in, in Francisco's uh, place at home, at his home. And it was very moving because it was, I think, in March uh, 2001 or February, uh, a few months before. I remember, um, you, 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 it was, uh, I think, Francisco went to, to Emmy's place like I mean, their place in Dordogne, Dordogne, no, and and uh, the room, and then they, they come back and they have kind of this kind of. He highlight the whole structure of the paper now in a, like it was like this. Uh, yeah, this, is, this paper is really a classic in the field, and I think you wrote it like I mean, you guys wrote it very quickly. That's something you, you would do. Yes, you would have this yeah. kind of insight, and then yes, we will work out the details together. 
uh, but see this connectivity also so that that kind of venue uh, that will keep us busy for a few years that's certainly true everybody is an insula <laughs> i see in the chat there is some some work on uh, from fabien picard also on um, ep epileptic uh, certain type of epileptic seizure and uh, which are inducing in the insula which are inducing um things uh I think sp spiritual um uh certain spiritual states i think so, so, so maybe there's some 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 kind of state of uh uh mystical states that i think she reported that in the literature there's a small literature on that question i think mm -hmm. i by the way i can give you a very short answer to uh, marika's question because she marika you asked whether there was still some space for francisco's multidisciplinarity in the contemporary academic system um I think it depends on the systems, but the French system, and I think that's one of the reasons why Francisco came here, gives you a lot of freedom, uh, I must say, it's still now, and you can do pretty much what you want <laughs> with yeah. very, very little pressure, uh, academic pressure. Uh, once you get the job. Once you get the job. So it's still possible, but we have to, we have to use it wisely. Yeah, and so that's why, for instance, for me, when I was in, in the US, I had this very poignant moment when I, I, I very proudly present my uh, the paper I wrote on neurophysiology to Richie, Richie and, he, and he was like, he looked me like that in a very like kind way, and he said, "Well, Antoine, you need to choose who you want to become. You know, you want to become a scientist, or if you want to become a philosopher." And and then I realized, okay, so I said, okay, I got the point. Uh, so now now that I'm back in France, I have a little bit more space to to continue. Um. I see uh, Annie Block uh, raised several questions in the chat. Uh, Annie, are you here? Uh, maybe you want to? Yeah. Yes, you want to select your question, which you want to start with? Because you questions. Uh, questions. questions. Well, it's, it's a question about the body and the, 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 the work on embodiment, which I see happening outside of uh, what you're talking about. I mean, I, uh, my observation, I knew Francisco in 1977. And at the time we we're talking about cognitive sciences. Now we have neurosciences and now we have brain sciences. And uh, what else? And I, I, uh, what I'm following, I'm also multidisciplinary. So I see the work of, uh, of embodiment come right now, both in terms of research and in terms of therapy coming from the work on the uh, autonomous nervous system. So I feel <laughs> I'm on, on a different planet with that. And uh, the, the, let's say Buddhist is not just a science of the mind. It's a science of body, speech, and mind. And if you're in touch with Tibetan doctors, uh, uh, Tibetan Lama who teach uh, yoga, Tibetan yoga, you have a totally different perspective uh, on all this. So I feel, uh, I see there's an island there. That's it. Thank you, Annie. Maybe, well, for me, I, the distinction between mind and body is not always easy. Um, and even between brain and body, I will give you an example. So what I did was um, uh, after Claire explained me how to do it, I sort of, got the notion I, I, I cannot do it as well as Claire, the Entretien d'Explicitation, the elicitation interview. I did that with a former tennis player who was in the top 30 in the world. And she was explaining me how she felt the ball, the tennis ball, when she's playing. And she said, well, basically, when I'm really playing very well, the ball is an extension of my body. I feel it as a part of my body, even though it's 30 meters away in, on the other side of the, of the net. So then I thought, okay, well, that's obviously, it's, it's a visual modality that does that, but somehow it's, this, that ball is incorporated into our body image. So the body is there too. Is it mind? Is it body? So it means it's super interesting to dig there what's, how we can extend our body, the image of the body to the things around us, even to other people as almost feeling them as part of our own body. Uh, but is that the body? Is that the mind? Really, I'm, I'm still puzzled. Um, yeah, I, th I think that the, 
um, in in a, in, a, in the field of affective neuroscience, that there is often you you try to to characterize not only the brain but also uh, the physiology, in particular respiration, the heart heartbeat. Um, uh, um, you can look also look at the, the way um, certain emotion, emotional states uh, are changing the body temperature. And we have techniques now to look at to find that. Um, so so there, there, there are ways to do it, and, and, and there's a whole theory. I mean, most of the theory uh, we try to understand the mind uh, are, are directly compatible with the um, body and mind in the sense that, that there is a understanding that, that that cognition or the when you say brain actually it's it, it's always an understanding that it, it is uh, uh, the brain are, are can't really function without the body and it, it, it is codified and co-constructed through body uh, interaction and and it's um, and it's just a, a proxy an easy things to do to measure the brain but it's there is an understanding that there, there is a, the body play a key role so so uh, so there is a lot to say, and 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 um, but uh, but I think sometimes just to be because it's difficult, we we just focus on the brain, but but with a, with an understanding that it's it's actually an unbodied uh, something, an organism organ which is unbodied. Uh, I mean, which is coupled with a body, and that leads to an embodiment of a mind. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and f- 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 yeah, and I say for instance, recently we just tried, we did a pilot study. Uh, in a recent study, and it's not published yet, but we try to look at the um, whole body illusion, for instance, meditators. So something we try to look at also. So that there are many, many things you can try. But the body is, uh, yeah. But still, I, uh, I feel uneasy. It's uh, what uh, Alan Wallace said. He, he dropped out of mind and life because he felt that uh, uh, somehow the, the Westerners were not willing to uh, learn from the Tibetans, from this science they have. And it's not an equal partnership. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's, I have an uneasy feeling about that, you know, because I've met, you know, I've met uh, Tibetan doctors, yogis, uh, they are uh, uh, teachers by yogis and it's, (laughs) <laughs> it's experimental and you can see there's really sophisticated knowledge there. So I'm not yes, sure we have been reaching to that and taking them as equals. I think in most of the, I, I see the tension here. And I think for instance, many of our first paper studies, we always, uh, we, we had a Buddhist expert like Mathieu Ricard who were co-signing the paper for instance, uh, or John Dunn who is a, a Tibetologist. So they really, and, um, and uh, when we design a task, for instance, i give you an example. We, so that, that's why I, I kind of somehow disagree with you. I think it's in a way, I think it's a very, there would be more to say, but I, I've, I know Alan for many years and I think, uh, I think there are way to create a gentle bridge and, and a symmetrical and caring bridge that goes both way in a respectful way. So at least that's, that's uh, what, what we try to do, and um, and for instance, when we when we w- recently we, we we when we design a pain task first, I give you a very simple example. We design a pain task and an fMRI pain task, and we had the chance to have a um, Claire Benson, who is a, a long-term yogi, maybe you know her, and and so we we for us it was important to to get her insight when we design the task to to be sure that that's. Uh, so we, we were the three three of us, we the PhD students, her and, and I, we, we did the task to get, we did a, this, so we were in circle and meditation cushion and we, we had our thermal pain and we, and so we got the thermal pain and we tried to meditate together and and, and somehow we tried to share our experience and, and try to identify the interesting um, dimension that could be captured also. And, and for instance, one of them was uh, this notion of how we, when you, you can really raise the mind, there is this kind of, uh, pain can can transform into something, turn from an aversive quality to something more blissful, almost. Uh, and and uh, that that that's just uh, when the feeling of aversion liberate, for instance. And so we, we just say, wow, that's interesting. Let put a let put in a, that dimension in the in the 
in the measure. And so, so that, that's, um, I mean, that, that's one way to go. And, but, but again, you need to realize that, for example, to do this study it took us more than six years and I, I still <laughs> struggling to, with the students to publish, uh, to finish because the, the fMRI study. So any study you do in, science, and in this field takes years. So, I mean, one day it would be great to, to work with uh, advanced uh, Tibetan doctors, but you need to find the right question, you need to find the right measure. And, and when, when in the 80s, uh, Francisco, uh, Francisco went with Alan Wallace and Richard Davidson in, um, in Dharamsala uh, with the EG equipment. And there's some picture around, you can see there arriving with a yogi in his little box. And, and they, they realized there was, they prepared like Kisha and pre spent months preparing this, this experience. And they came back with no, not a single data. And they realized that like, just, just there was a clash of culture and perception that just didn't really understand just pressing a button, you know, what it means and why would you press a button to do a task? And so, so there's just also, there's a lot of interesting uh, anthropological question around. And I think uh, it's not that we are like, uh, not interested in that, but it's just very pragmatical. And I think for me, my experience, it's much easier to work with Westerners who have done three year retreats. And one, one, one yogi who came to my, band, my, my our study, and now is teach, teach also an intervention, he spent like 10 years on three year retreat. And he, did, he did one three year retreat and then he went on a solitary retreat for complete the 10 year retreat. And so, so I think it's easier culturally from, for us to work with people who are culturally equivalent at that stage of the game. In five, 10 years, great, but it, you need to go step by steps. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I answer you, your concern, but. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but thanks for your feedback. Well, I'll get in touch. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Annie, and, and uh, uh, thanks for this part of the conversation. Um, I can see uh, there was a question very, way above uh, in the chat uh, from Sophia Varsan. Sophia, are you here still? Uh, maybe you wanna ask your question yourself. Um, hi, thank you all for this experience. I'm in a place where there's a lot of noise, so I don't know if you can hear me properly because I'm living in Costa Rica, so here we have a lot of music all the time. Um, I personally feel um, really touched by what you shared and I'm really, really thankful for this experience. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Antoine and Jean-Philippe, and also maybe Nathalie, um, about how have you been putting this to practice, this um, first person science, this science from within, um, for me, it's actually a big challenge to start doing science from within. So it's it's nice to hear about your experience with that. And and yeah, I'm really, really grateful again for this experience. So these kind of instances are really important for me. So thank you all for sharing. You're so beautiful people and I feel you all a lot. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Sofia. Maybe we'd like to be with you in Costa Rica. <laughs> yeah, it looks like a nice place over there. Yeah, <laughs> this music. Maybe I can give you an example. Uh, so, for instance, we have this uh, project, Atoll, A T O L E, which is designed to promote the education of attention in schools. So, we'd like to provide kids, six to 11, six to 12, means to actually regain some mastery over their attention. Uh, one thing that's especially distracting is, uh, I mean, when you have a young kid, we, if you put a video game or a phone or whatever, what's, whatever is exciting, that there is, a, of course, the distraction is very strong uh, because it's very, yeah, it's very attractive. Um, so one thing that we do, we have this sort of double approach. First, we explain them what the reward system is in the brain. That means that system that creates some approach behavior toward what is stimulating, what creates rewards. So we explain them. We, we might even talk about dopamine, uh, for instance. Uh, so that's how the system works. But if you just do that, it's very intellectual and there is no effect. I mean, the, the kid would just be, ah, okay, yeah, 
okay, whenever I, I feel like uh, dropping my work or whatever, I just uh, spending hours on Netflix, uh, that's my reward system, okay, but no change in behavior. So what we want to promote is the ability to, to detect really in their own experience, the very beginning of the distraction, how it all starts, the beginning of the attraction towards the, the number, the, the episode number 20, 20 of Netflix or, or the smartphone or whatever, because it feels like something. There is a very, there is a very characteristic feeling of attraction and it, it involves uh, different uh, senses. Uh, sometimes you can get a good, uh, good feeling in your uh, almost gustatory or olfactory, uh, a feeling of release, of tension. And so we explain them how that attraction can manifest itself into these kind of, of feelings, just from a mechanistic point of view. And then what we explain them is that they have to develop this first person approach of being able to recognize the signs, early signs of distraction in the, in the first second of the attraction. And that's in their, in their, in their own experience. So it's called, it's, we call that an informed introspection. So introspection informed by what we know about the brain. And that's really first person. And without that first person approach, developing this ability to, to, to notice those signs in this first per person experience, there is no way to restabilize their attention immediately uh, before it's completely swallowed uh, and, and caught away. So that would, be a, a, that would be a use of the first person perspective. So we would call that almost, we tend to say this more of phenomenological cybernetics, cybernetics in the way of, of, of trying to find ways to control in a smart way a system. So the system that the, that the kid is, 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 uh, is controlling is itself basically his attention and uh, through phenomenology. So that's one example. And, and I, can, I can really do a, a, another example that follow up very nicely with what uh, jean philippe just said. Uh, so it's a study, actually, I mentioned it because it's, um, it took place with, a, with a, a graduate student, which is now very close to you. She's in Chile. Her name is uh, Constanza, Constanza Bacagano. <laughs> South America. Right. So, so um, she's, um, we, we, we really try to, 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 to study this, this, this very specific um, uh, first person quality of being uh, uh, stuck into, into an object or be, when your attention is grabbed by, uh, for instance, um, a nice images on Netflix or a nice food, a nice something that seduces the mind. So it could be, could be food, it could be something, uh, uh, whatever, whatever things you like. And so we, 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 then we, we train the participant to, to um, cultivate uh, this capacity to to become aware of that that of that uh, sense of uh, of stickiness in the mind, and, and just to to be able to observe it and and just recognize that it's just your mind, and and then we we and um, so this it's it's a it's a gesture that Francisco used to call it epoche when you suspend the, what something appears as being solid and real, and so you cultivate. The participant to, to just become aware of that and then to let go. And that's something that you cultivate a lot in mindfulness meditation. And so then, based on that, that was really the core question of a PhD. And we, we designed a task that, that when we can not only I mean train a little bit the participant. Uh, and for, for instance, the way we train when there is many ways, when she was very creative and she, for instance, she she found them an, an a very nice optical illusion when you, you have this. Um, the so 3D illusion you can you can get when you can put a little frog, for instance, in a in a in a mirror, a, a sphere, spheric mirror, and that's create an, an optical illusion when the, the 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 frog which is inside the the, the spheric mirror appear on the top as if it was real. So that was really uh, so we, we use this that to 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 demonstrate to the participant what it mean by this uh, this sense of being real and um, as as displayed by this illusion. And then we trained them to, to describe their experience, to become aware of that and to practice. And then we did a task when we, we measure uh, not only the experience, but also the, the brain, the EEG, electroencephalogram response when they look at food, food images, we measure salivation, and then uh, a behavior task that, that look at the, uh, that measure the food approach, an approach avoidance those task that's me measured how much you, your mind is biased once you have been immersed into an image and you lost into an image. 
So those are just an illustration of how we try to, to integrate that. And Natalie, you want to say something? Yeah, I could, uh, you know, on a different uh, uh, level, maybe. Um, I think what I uh, learned from uh, the first person uh, method and uh, microphenomenology now is to uh, actually to, to, uh, write, to try to embody far more phenomenology as it is. So in a, in a quite a, a provocative way, sometimes I say that phenomenology, the third person philosophy, and uh, in order to, for, for it to become a first person uh, philosophy, it really needs to be uh, experiential, far more experiential. And my students, I mean, with my students, I, in the, some master seminars, so sometimes in a provocative way, I try to show them how they can switch from a conceptual level to ex an experiential level. So we, we, we use texts, phenomenological texts, and first we actually, we, uh, we just, um, uh, summarize, I mean, the conceptual level and the arguments and the, everything what we usually do in philosophy, I mean, in a quite standard way. And then we switch to the experiential level. So the idea is to, uh, uh, to try to find out what kind of experience is underlying actually the conceptual, uh, the conceptual uh, 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 description and uh, to, to help them see actually what, uh, what in, the, in the text uh, often very implicitly uh, um, described. So uh, I, the idea is really to, to have a kind of what I call an experiential reading of the text and um, uh, using the intuition as a guide uh, in order to find out the, I mean, the real concrete description they can, uh, um, I mean, um, unveil, I would say, uh, from, uh, from the text, but which is implicit, which is not, uh, explicitly given so uh, so it's uh, well it's a it's a quite an interesting exploratory way to uh, to do so that would could be an example of how to use first person method in order to more embody more uh, phenomenology textual phenomenology i would say thank, thank you, you all for your answers um, I would like to add some small part that has been like through my mind for a lot of time and I haven't found an answer yet, but um, about doing this uh, science for um, the embodied mind and the embodied consciousness, um, I have been wondering how to to measure the whole body, the body as, a, as one. And I have been thinking about maybe measuring the electromagnetic field of the whole body and how it expands um, in certain um, meditative experiences. Maybe you have done um, some kind of research about measuring the whole body because that's an idea that I've had for a, for a long, long time, and I haven't found like how to to take it into practice. I, I, we we've not done it uh, in our in our lab, and um, um, so I, I I don't know of a technology. I yeah, apparently there, there are some, some some people are trying to develop a technology for this type of things. I don't know how rigorous it is. Apparently, some of the, the some Russian scientists developed techniques to do that, but I I don't know how far we are in um, and how much has been done to to carry this type of approach in mainstream science. So I, I don't know. Thank you, thank you, Sophia, for your question and uh, also this discussion. Um, I would like to uh, invite Bruce Bruce Bao. Uh, because you posted some remarks in the chat, not questions necessarily, but uh, interesting notes uh, around. Uh, uh, I'm just uh, looking at it around the symposium in uh, San Diego with Evan Thompson, uh, addressing a previous topic we were talking about, um, and also uh, uh, you mentioned mind as a process which trans transduces the brain and the body, as Var Varela Maturana and Bateson introduced at Santiago. So, do you wanna do you wanna share a little bit more on these two remarks you made in the chat related to that part of the discussion when you when you posted them? Um, yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I, um, 
can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Bruce. Um, yeah, the, the conversation about embodiment um, brought me back to an uh, early presentation at um, uh, two papers at the Santiago conference uh, that uh, Varela and Maturano made uh, in parallel with Gregory Bateson. And I think some of this had come out of their uh, Lindisfarne discussions uh, even earlier at um, uh, William Thompson's uh, place, but uh, basically it was to, to go back to uh, concepts that William James had had a hundred years before, that the mind was not an entity, but it was actually a process. And uh, if, if one understands the mind as a process, which is uh, transducing the embodied brain, in other words, the, uh, uh, the, the brain and the body is part of the, uh, uh, the active process in the present moment, uh, as also is the contextual environment, uh, physical, social, and cultural, uh, one can understand the, the interrelationship. Uh, of course, this is not, uh, one would see then the, uh, the neural pathways of the brain uh, as, as being changed uh, by the uh, combined process and uh, also that they become interactive um, as uh, time moves on, as uh, present moment continues, um, they influence the mind. Uh, so that was really just a comment, uh, which actually derived from a very early presentation uh, of uh, Francisco's and uh, obviously has led on to the inactive embodied uh, view of the uh, mind, uh, which is uh, what a lot of the uh, philosophers of mind are now working on. Uh, the other comment was, uh, uh, um, uh, Antoine was talking about uh, the use of uh, anthro uh, anthropologists, and it just brought me back to the um, uh, Evan Thompson's closing uh, address at the San Diego Mind and Life International Symposium, uh, when he also, um, you know, raised uh, some questions about the relationship of the mind and the brain, and. Uh, the, the fact that the mind as a process is, is, is contextually um, uh, derived physically, socially, and culturally. And, and he suggested, though I don't imagine it was taken up by too many groups, that all research groups should include a cultural anthropologist uh, uh, in, in their team uh, in order to look at this uh, inactive uh, uh, process that is the mind. So it was just a couple of comments on the conversation. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, any reflection, final reflection on that, on these points, Antoine and Jean-Philippe? We are coming to the end of the discussion soon. Yeah, you know, I think, it, I mean, uh, if just a brief comment, I think I think I agree with Bruce. I mean, it's a, uh, it, it, uh, Francisco often, uh, Use for instance the metaphor of the of the tornado, you know, to to as a as a, um, as, a as a metaphor to to talk about um, the mind as a the self organizing capacity of the mind when there is really no center, but you but as a tornado can still destroy a, a house, you know, and um, so the, it's 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 a self organizing. Uh, um, Something a self organizing process, and and so and the virtue of you talking about process is you could, it's qu it's quite neutral metaphysically. So you, you, it's it's very practi practical and and you in that sense very useful. So I I, I feel very comfortable and and for the anthropological uh, the anthropologist I think it's um, I don't know whether you we should we should do it uh, all the time because but for a certain question in particular when you work with experts practitioners uh, we find it extremely useful and I. Uh, one of our first work in in, um, in medicine with Richard Davidson, we, we had a chance to meet uh, John Dunn, who is a, a Tibetologist, and, and he was very, he was instrumental to to really uh, help us, for instance, understand the way that the expert practitioner was reading a certain scale. So we we asked them to do 
Mathieu suggests that we, we explore a so-called non-dual meditation. It's called uh, open presence or in Tibetan, uh, Rikpa Chak. And, and that's, and I was very naive about all these states and, and uh, I didn't realize that, that when you, you ask to, to, to say whether you can reach this state, it's pretty much asking someone, are you unlighted? And, and so when we start to, to, uh, to with one of the first experts who arrived, exact meditators, they were in the lab and we asked, you know, uh, um, we flew them from, I think, from Canada and one from Asia. And so they arrived, which was doing very well, with the EG, and they asked that to meditate. And then I arrived my little scales and say, it's okay, um, what was your achievement on, on scale from zero, from zero to nine on, in, the, in the practice of uh, Rikpacha Chak? And as always like that. Uh, and then you say, uh, well, probably two. And, uh, but I don't know, maybe I reached a three, but I'm not so sure. No, probably two. So it took us a while to really understand that you have to explain that it's we asking just uh, why what we, why we asking that and why we need to have piety why or the way to to rank the the what the nine value means for us. So and that and and I think someone like John Dunn was really useful to to help us understand the tradition, which was that you're not supposed first you're not supposed to talk about your realization and then you no one will ever brag that they can you know do this state at a scale on scale of nine. So, just two comments. What Thank you, you want want uh, Jean Philippe, may I ask uh, the last question of the of the meeting today? You you gave the title to this uh, talk, uh, the Francisco Varela experience. Uh, are you experienced? Uh, so, what, what is the Var Francisco Varela experience? <laughs> well, first the talk was, uh, I was listening to Jimi Hendrix at the moment when, we, when you asked uh, for a title. So, and then I thought, oh, experience, that's really Francisco. That's what it's all about. Just bringing the experience at the very center. So that's how the, the title comes. So, wow, that's a tough question for the last one. What it was like, what was the Francisco Viola experience? It was, uh, it was enlightening. <laughs> you, we didn't reach enlightenment, but that was enlightening. Uh, I tell warmth, uh, intellectual uh, stimulation all the time. Sometimes you could, when you were discussing science with Francisco, it was almost physical. I mean, it was intellectual, but the way mm. sometimes each of us, we try to corner the other one, just put, put the other one in the corner where you had to say, okay, well, you, you won. Uh, it, it could get very... Them, them, it was embodied in a way, in this sense of space and just cornering, just making, just reducing the space of your opponent. I mean, I, opening in a good way. Uh, so that was part of the interaction with Francisco too, extremely stimulating and joyful. Thank you, Jean-Philippe. I, I really like this distinction between enlightening and enlightenment because this uh, leads us to the experience of process again, what we heard about the mind as a process, but also the experience as a process and becoming enlightened uh, as an enlightening process. So I think uh, this word is uh, really uh, talking about the, the, the essence, what we are doing here together. Thank you so much, uh, Antoine. And thank you so much, uh, Jean-Philippe, for your really engaging uh, uh, dialogue uh, with us all here. Thank you all for joining us today and participating in this in this meeting and uh, discussion. I would like to thank uh, Genevieve for the French translation, Genevieve uh, Amelie, and to you all who uh, who joined the French channel that you 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 are with us uh, here uh, in Mind and Life Europe. And uh, finally, I would just like to mention uh, two upcoming events in the series. Um, the first one will be on November 10th um, with Amy uh, Varela herself. You are going to uh, talk about your experience of uh, uh, having discussions with Francisco and uh, what you lived and what you experienced and how he affected your thinking and your journey in life, uh, as we heard it from others. And then the, after, the next one after that, uh, still in November, we will have two seminars in November. It will be with uh, Wolf Singer, uh, November 25th. And the title of that uh, webinar will be, I'm just uh, taking a look. Uh, 
why would a neurobiologist became interested in Buddhist philosophy? So we will hear from Wolf, Wolf Zinger, the neurobiologist, uh, why he became interested in Buddhist philosophy and how Francisco played a role in that and what role he played. So we will continue the series. Thank you so much uh, again uh, for being with us here tonight. And I hope uh, you enjoyed the discussion and uh, you will enjoy the next ones as well. And I wish you all the best and good night or a good day wherever you are in Costa Rica or in Europe or elsewhere in the world. Uh, thank you. And thank you, Antoine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Good to see you.